Hey everyone, Bandit here. To continue my series of explaining the lore and backstories of the various characters introduced to us in Elden Ring, I have chosen Rani the Witch as my next story fleshing out victim, which I will explain once again in a way that anyone can understand. However, before we tackle Rani, since going live with the last video covering Merica, I was chatting with my good buddy Monster Maze, who you guys should totally check out because he's about to go live with some Elden Ring content, and we were just, you know, swapping stories, talking about bosses, contemplating lore, and he brought to my attention several pieces of actual in-game dialogue from Merica that I completely missed because they didn't show up for me, and I still can't get them to show up. But thankfully, someone uploaded a text dump of every piece of dialogue in the game, so as long as I know keywords of what I'm searching for, I've got all the references I need. And I'll link to this text dump in the description below if anyone else is interested in text dumpster diving. Anyway, I wanted to quickly cover these new quotes as a sort of addendum to my Merica Explained video before going on to Rani, and if you're not interested in hearing some extra juicy tidbits of lore about the Eternal Queen, then no worries, just skip ahead to the timestamp displayed on screen. And once again, there are spoilers in this video about many things. You've been warned. Apparently, when you're resting at the grace spots in some churches and other areas across the lands between, there's a chance or some sort of trigger that I haven't figured out yet that will result in Melina just manifesting out of thin air like she do, and offering to dictate to you Merica's words that she apparently said to various individuals in a time Time past. When you rest at the Third Church of Merica, for instance, Melina pops up and says this, the words of Queen Merica, who vanished long ago, if you wish, I will share them with you. Very well, in Merica's own words, my lord and thy warriors, I divest each of thee of thy grace. With thine eyes dimmed, ye will be driven from the lands between. Ye will wage war in a land afar, where ye will live and die. When you go to the Church of Pilgrimage, she continues by saying this, then, after thy death, I will give back what I once claimed. Return to the lands between wage war and brandish the Elden Ring. Grow strong in the face of death, warriors of my lord, Lord Godfrey. She continues elsewhere by saying, I declare mine intent to search the depths of the Golden Order. Through understanding of the proper way, our faith, our grace, is increased. Those blissful early days of blind belief are long past. My comrades, why must ye falter? And finally, once more by saying, Hark, brave warriors, hark, my lord Godfrey. We commend your deeds. Guidance hath delivered ye through each ordeal to the place ye stand. Put the giants to the sword, and confine the flame atop the mount. Let a new epoch begin, an epoch glistening with life. Brandish the Elden Ring for the age of the Erd Tree. From these quotes, to me, it sounds most like Merica was speaking to Lord Godfrey, obviously, and his warriors, before they assaulted the fire giants, like I was talking about in my last video. But the most interesting takeaway to me is the fact that Merica told them that they would become tarnished and would be stripped of grace and then resurrected. It proves that the desperation of the greater will in administering grace to the tarnished, which includes you, the player, was always a part of Merica's plan. Pretty good proof for the fact that Merica was not super content with the greater will itself. But I'm still convinced that Merica is no boy scout, because even though I mentioned Gideon's fear at glimpsing into the will of Merica last time, I didn't mention what he says to you after you kill him. He says that a tarnished cannot become a lord, not even you. And he said this after glimpsing into the will of Queen Merica, meaning that even though Merica created the Tarnished to one day return and help her out with the whole rebellion against the greater will, it isn't going to end well for you, who would be the Elden Lord. Gideon knew it and tried to stop us because whatever Merica had planned after the Elden Beast was removed from her body made him shudder from fear. There are a few other quotes from Merica, but they don't necessarily deepen the lore, so I'll leave those up to you to hopefully stumble across in the game if you're more lucky than I am. But the last one I'll mention is a very peculiar quote indeed. She talks directly to Radagon and says, O Radagon, leal hound of the Golden Order, thou art yet to become me, thou art yet to become a god. Let us be shattered both, mine other self. Okay, not only is this huge, because it is the only time to my knowledge in the entire game where we can actually see at least part of a conversation between Radagon and Merica, but it also seems to imply that the shattering was something they both agreed upon doing, no doubt to be followed by Radagon's reforging. If you remember in the last video, I said that I believed Radagon was literally a great 
rune. And by the way, that crisscross pattern that I had a hunch was a great rune is proven to be a great rune by the description of Radagon's Scar Seal and Sword Seal talismans. Thank you very much, Zen F Pal, for your comment. And combining that notion with Merica's quote and the original trailer for the game, we are left with the fuller picture of Merica telling Radagon that they both need to be shattered and reforged back together because Radagon was yet to become her, meaning the plan was for him to become her. I still believe that Radigan was created from Merica initially since she calls him her other self before Radigan becomes her, meaning this was a reunion, if you will. And Merica probably needed Radigan to enter her body once again because she knew the Greater Will would imprison her and prevent her from moving. But Radigan would still be able to take over the body and carry out her will should the Tarnished fail to enter the Erd Tree and destroy the Elden Beast, controlling Merica from within, which was more than likely her ultimate plan to use the Tarnished in order to free herself of the Elden Beast and control of the Greater Will. However, Radigan, once inside Merica's body, being the quote, leal hound of the Golden Order, decided that the Elden Beast needed to remain right where it was, and rebelled against Merica's wishes by trying to stop the Tarnished by closing off the tree from entry and even attempting to stop you himself once you burn the tree and enter anyway. Finally giving us an explanation and closure to not only Radigan's hostility, but also Merica's plan in its entirety. Another interesting smaller Merica detail is that the smith, Hugh, who appears to be of the misbegotten race who are usually imprisoned or forced into slavery, located in the Round Table Hold, is implied to be imprisoned there by Queen Merica, since he can be heard praying to her asking for mercy. It seems that he was tasked by Merica to aid the Tarnished Warriors and either create a weapon powerful enough to or help the Tarnished become capable of killing a god, most likely the Greater Will, which is something that the people of no Kron also tried to do in order to kill the Greater Will and were subsequently wiped out over, but more on that in a bit. Just a little more proof that Merica was actively working against the Greater Will, and as you can tell, these Merica quotes and other pieces of lore were kind of a big deal, but there weren't too many of them, which is why I decided to talk about them here, because there wasn't quite enough to make another entire video for. But now that we're well over 1,000 words into what is supposed to be Ronnie's video, let's actually start talking about Ronnie. In the first place, and this is something I didn't do last time, I think that in order to talk about Ronnie, we first need to establish an understanding of what exactly an Empyrean is. Since Ronnie claims that both she and the twins, Mikola and Millennia, are Empyreans, yet we never get a straight answer as to what makes an Empyrean an Empyrean. And now I've said Empyrean too many times and it doesn't sound real anymore. Anyway, most fans of Elden Ring lore know by now that the claimed explanation for what makes an Empyrean comes from the item description of the Remembrance of the Rot Goddess, which the player obtains upon killing Millennia. It says, quote, Mikola and Millennia are both the children of a single god. As such, they are both Empyreans, but suffered afflictions from birth. This was quickly accepted as meaning that those born of a single god are Empyrean, which does seem to be what the quote is implying directly. However, it's also become more and more debated as people claim that the quote is instead simply saying that being born of a single god means they were inbred and therefore is the reasoning behind their afflictions. I do think that if you take this quote by itself and nothing else into account, this is bound to be eternally debatable. But allow me to provide my personal take on the matter. I think that the quote has to be pointing to the single god origin for Empyreans for two reasons. One, because of the way this description was written. It literally says that they're born of a single god and as such they are Empyreans. That as such part there is another way of saying because of this or therefore and is meant to relate the idea that's coming next with the idea that came before. For instance, I could say my vehicle was made by Honda. As such, it is a car, but has, I don't know, a stinky interior or something. The phrase immediately following that as such is what relates to the first statement directly. In this case, Empyrean equals from a single god, like car equals made by Honda in my amazing example. The affliction suffered from birth part is just another fact being brought up about the Empyrean twins, just like the stinky interior is simply a fact brought up about my Honda car. Send air fresheners. The second reason I think the single god theory is true is because of the inverse, that is, the fact that only Michaela, Millennia, and Rani are Empyreans, according to Rani. None of the other demigods are Empyrean, who are also all the children of Marika or Radigan, aka the god in this very statement, and what is the 
only difference between the Empyrean demigods and the others? Yup, it is conveniently that Mikola and Millennia were born of Radigan and Merica, one god. Combine all these trains of thought together, and even though it is still admittedly debatable, and it is possible that being an Empyrean simply means just being chosen of the greater will, I just happen to think it's a bit more believable that Empyreans must have come from a single god, and that there has to be a literal requirement. Because I can't think of any reasons why some of the others, like the super loyal to the Golden Order General Radon, for instance, would not be a chosen Empyrean in that case. But I hear you wondering, Bandit, what about Rani? Isn't she the child of Renala and Radigan, which according to your own words would make her not an Empyrean? What a wonderful question and perfect segue into finally talking about Rani's story properly. It all begins with an egg. This egg. Remember how last time I was talking about Radigan falling in love with Renala and the two of them marrying and making little red-haired babies together? And then how Radigan broke Renala's heart when he left her to return to America and make babies with his other self instead? Well, upon leaving the Queen of the Full Moon, Radigan randomly gifted her with an egg. Or was it random? See, it's a big mystery as to why he would give her an egg of all things, but fortunately we can read item descriptions and speak to Sir Gideon off near the all-knowing for some more information. According to Gideon, turns out that Radigan's gift to Renala is a great rune inside the egg. The great rune of the unborn, to be exact. The description of the rune itself also reconfirms this, and it also tells us that that unborn part of the rune is referring to unborn demigods, and tells us that the egg itself is actually made of amber, which comes from the sap of the Erd tree and has primordial life inside. Now this next section is going to be kind of theoretical, but bear with me, it's going to make sense, I promise. If Rani is an Empyrean, and Empyreans have to originate from a single god, then I believe that Rani actually came from the rune of the unborn demigods. Or maybe it would be better to say it came from her. See, Rani calls Renala her mother, and the giant smith E.G. confirms that Rani grew up at the Caria Manor. So she's probably not a child of Merica and Radigan, but as we can see on her dead corpse, which I will explain later in the video, even though the corpse is charred, we can tell that Rani had red hair when she was a physical being. Red hair is obviously a direct connection to Radigan's lineage. Gideon also tells us that Rani once had a great rune herself, but that she cast it aside, which is huge because that rune has to be accounted for. And it just so happens that her mother, who is not herself a demigod, is in possession of a great rune gifted to her by Radigan. So perhaps the entire point behind the great rune of the unborn is that it was Rani, Radigan's last gift to Renala, a demigod child that he created. And when certain events transpired, which we will get to in just a bit, Rani cast aside her physical body. Radigan's created child was undone, unborn, also casting aside her great rune, which her mother found out about and was driven to insanity over, losing her perfect child and last remembrance of Radigan placing Rani's great rune inside an amber egg, forever trying to use the amber as magic to rebirth her precious daughter Rani, but forever creating imperfect clones. Now of course, this is unfortunately still theoretical and has not yet been confirmed by anything in-game, but it is the most believable origin story for Rani that ties everything I've talked about together so far. So for now, this is what I'm going with. Moving on, once Rani was given to Renala, who became her adoptive mother, Radigan left to return to Merica's side, which according to several sources left Renala absolutely heartbroken and completely beside herself, which led the other members of the Academy to realize that she, deep down, does not possess the real qualities of a champion. Present day Renala is a mind-broken individual who is obsessed with birthing imperfect children from the rune inside the amber egg over and over again, calling them her sweeties, even offering to make you one of her sweeties, potentially even creating said sweeties from dead people, since she asks if her sweeties have left to become gravestones to be better born anew, possibly in reference to her dead daughter Rani. But even though present day Renala is a crazy sweetie lady who really misses her family, this does not change the fact that she was Rani's mother when Rani still walked to the earth as one of the living. And her influence on Rani because she raised her is quite apparent, since Rani did not grow up in Landell to believe in the Golden Order, but rather grew up in Caria Manor with a keen interest in the Order of the Stars, which is proof of influence from her mother and one other person. You can also find what what is most likely Renala's talisman on Rani's corpse, and when fighting Renala, a deadly spell that Rani left to protect her mother takes over, and a fabricated Renala fights you in the real Renala's stead. And after defeating the spell, Renala says, Oh little Rani, my dear daughter, weave thy knight into being, further proving to us that the two were close, and again painting the picture that Rani was 
in fact raised by her mother, not her father. It also makes sense from an emotional standpoint that Ronnie would grow up to despise the Golden Order because that was the very reason her father abandoned her mother and Ronnie herself, and subsequently broke Rinala's heart and mind. Before Ronnie was very old, she was recognized as an Empyrean by her own two fingers and given a shadow, Blythe, which as I mentioned in the last video is one of the requirements to become the vessel of the Elden Ring. E.G. mentions that the two of them grew up together, and that Blythe was accepted into the family by Rinala to be Ronnie's stepbrother, which inevitably led to their becoming very close. One day, when Ronnie was a bit older, she was playing in the woods and came across a mysterious individual known as the Snow Witch, who became Ronnie's secret mentor and taught her cold sorceries and to fear the Dark Moon. The doll and clothing that we now know Ronnie to possess was actually modeled after the Snow Witch, not Ronnie's physical body. It was around this time that Ronnie decided she didn't want the fate that the two fingers were trying to force upon her. She did not want to be, quote, controlled by that thing. That thing most likely being a reference to what would happen if she were to succeed Queen Merica. A reference to the Elden Beast, currently residing inside Queen Merica, and which even Merica herself extravagantly plotted against. When she explained her plight to her best friends, e.g. the giant and Blythe, her brother, they both were completely willing to forsake the greater will and instead follow her. Blythe was even said to be willing to defy destiny itself if it would ever have him betray Ronnie. And after her new ventures into cold magic, he donned a cape because he was cold, which is adorable. Aww. At some point, Ronnie's defiance of the Golden Order led her to research how to get rid of the Golden Order, and her research either from the Snow Witch or studyings of the Academy yielded her with a complex solution to the entire problem. And the first step of that solution was that she had to die physically in order to shed herself of her Empyrean body. But she could not be killed by normal means, which is why she stole the Rune of Death from Malekith, also known as Destined Death, in order to take her own life and create the Black Knives, which are the weapons used by the assassins on the Night of the Black Knives, as the demigods began to fall. But things get a little complicated when the actual plan goes down and Rani steals the Rune of Death and gets killed, but then so does Godwin, Merica's firstborn favorite son, at the exact same time, in fact, which led to only half of the completed Curse Mark of Death being carved into Ronnie's flesh, with the other half being carved into Godwin's. This is confusing, but my prevailing theory is as follows. What if using destined death to kill somebody means having the curse mark carved into their body, period? And what if having that curse mark carved into your flesh means that you will be eliminated wholly from reality, as in both in spirit and in flesh? But what if Ronnie figured out that you can cheat the system if you interrupt the mark halfway, so that it would only kill one element of your being or the other, but not both, since her conscious the spirit still needed to be kept alive and she needed her physical body to die, what if she had to choose someone else's spirit to be killed in her stead? And it also had to be the spirit of a demigod, like herself. Cue the assassination of Godwin the Golden, a demigod who had his spirit taken from him with half of the curse mark of death carved on his body so that Ronnie's could live on. Also, by the way, the Black Knife assassins themselves who carried out Ronnie's mission of assassinating Godwin the Golden are actually all women from the land of Newman. The same land where Queen Merica came from, with, quote, close ties to Merica herself. I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure what to make of that at this present point in time, but I just wanted to throw it out there for your information, to do with what you will. I may return to explaining them at some point in the future if you guys want, but anyway, back to Ronnie. With her plan successfully carried out and her body killed with her spirit lingering, she was then bound to a doll that was made to resemble her tutor, the Snow Witch, which is the body that she uses functionally to this day. As proven to us in one of the game trailers, the murder of Godwin triggered the war known as the Shattering, after which the Greater Will extended its grace to the tarnished and the events of the game begin. At this point, Ronnie's story can actually be expounded upon in-game through her questline, which is something I will do now. Ronnie actually appears before the Tarnished pretty quickly, although she hides her true name and instead calls herself Renna for some reason. Maybe in a reference to her mother Renala, but either way, she appears and claims that Torrent, your trusty steed's former owner, entrusted her with a gift for you, since you now own Torrent. She gives you the spirit-calling bell and then says she doubts the two of you will ever meet again and wonders aloud 
about how long you will trust the word of the two fingers before vanishing away into thin air. Now, because of her one closed eye, her vanishing in and out of thin air, and her relation to Torrent, or at least Torrent's former master, there is a theory out there that Ronnie is Melina, your finger maiden, who is apparently Torrent's former owner and gave you Torrent's calling whistle. But one thing that's weird with this theory is the fact that Melina could have just given you the spirit calling bell at any point herself, just like she gave you Torrent's whistle. So it's unexplainable why she would have chosen to have Ronnie, I mean Rena, randomly give it to you instead. But talking about that theory is big enough for another video on its own, so I digress. The next time you meet Ronnie is after making your way through the Carrier Manor. You know, the one that's full of those finger spiders. Beyond the manor is an area called the Three Sisters, with three towers located within, one called Rena's Rise, one called Selvius's Rise, and the last called Ronnie's Rise. Understandably, Ronnie is waiting for you in Ronnie's Rise. When you talk to her, she says she doesn't remember giving you an invitation, but since you're just so darn interesting, you might be interested in swearing loyalty to her purpose in helping her out? Obviously you say yes, and at this point she tells you to go introduce yourself to the other members of her motley crew, e.g. the Giant, Blythe the Wolfman, and Selvius the Pervert who, by the way, has an entire other quest line where he tries to have you transform Ronnie into his own personal play doll for use in his dungeon. Anyway, after introducing yourself to all the members of Team Ronnie, she explains to you that she sent Blythe into the eternal city of Nokron, deep beneath the surface, in order to find a hidden treasure. The next step in her quest to overturn the Golden Order, and that you should go meet up with Blythe and help him out. However, when you meet Blythe, he's stumped and has absolutely no idea how to actually get into Nokron. After a little bit of chatting, he asks asks you to ask Selvius, who asks you to ask Selen about what to do next, and when you ask Selen, she reveals to you that the reason you can't find your way forward is probably because General Radon is blocking the fate of the Carrier Royal family from moving forward. But let me explain what that means. Basically, at some point, most likely in between Godwin's murder and the Shattering War, but possibly way before, maybe even leading to Ronnie's plan being executed in the first place, we don't know for sure, General Radon, the son of Renala, who was loyal to his father and the Golden Order instead of his mother and the Carrier Royal family, took it upon himself to personally use his gravity magic and freeze the stars in place, which according to Selen, were the carriers of the fate of the Carrion Royal family. She says that if Radon were to die, then it's possible that the stars would once again move and resume opening fate's door for Ronnie. So that's exactly what you and Blythe do next. You head down southeast to Redmain Castle and challenge and after about 25 tries, defeat General Radon. And and right after his defeat, just like Selen said, his power wanes and the stars resume their movement and an asteroid crashes to the Earth, opening the way properly to the city of Nokron. And let me just pause for a second to say that General Radon is an absolute badass. Okay, moving on. You venture through this new opening in the Earth into the city of Nokron and eventually come across the treasure that Ronnie needs, the Finger Slayer Blade, which is a blade capable of killing the two fingers and harming the greater will that the people of Nokron created long ago. You return to Ronnie's rise and give the blade to Ronnie, who admits that she's surprised you were the one to retrieve it and not Blythe. She offers you a strange statue as a reward, says hi to Torrent, then says she's gotta leave and do something alone and says goodbye once again. At this point though, some astute players might notice that her shadow, Blythe, is nowhere to be found. And this is where things get kind of sad. If you talk to E.G. before going into Nokron, he says that you should go on without Blythe, because Blythe was given another important mission from Rani, apparently. However, Rani's reaction about you getting the blade before Blythe proves that she didn't tell Blythe to do anything else. E.G. the giant was lying to you. See, if you venture to the forlorn Evergal, you can hear howling, and upon approaching the magical prison, you find out that Blythe himself self is trapped inside, and he was trapped in there by none other than E.G. the Giant, who told Blythe that he would bring bail to Lady Ronnie, which is an old English word that means destructive evil. Blythe is saddened and confused by this and claims that he is a part of his sister, Ronnie's being, her shadow, and that there was no chance that something like that would ever happen. You have the option to either let him free or keep him imprisoned, but whatever you choose, if you go to E.G. and report that you found Blythe, he will say that Blythe was given to Ronnie by the two fingers and therefore harbors a dark secret. Which is, that if an Empyrean were to refuse the will of the Two Fingers, that Empyrean's shadow would go mad and become a horrible curse upon the Empyrean. He says that it doesn't matter what Blythe thinks, because this is something that is pre-programmed into his very being to do, should Ronnie ever resist the greater will, and says that Blythe needs to be neutralized. But we're gonna pause on Blythe's story and resume Ronnie's, since they take place separately from this point forward. Meantime, Ronnie did indeed leave to embark on the next 
last part of her quest, and to follow after her, you'll have to go through a portal in Rena's Rise where you will find her hilariously disguised as a smaller doll. After trying to speak with her multiple times at the nearby Grace, she finally opens up and tells you that you need to eliminate the Baleful Shadows which prowl the lands. The Baleful Shadows are assassins that the Two Fingers sent to kill Ronnie, since she is now not only resisting their plan, but is an active threat to it. It's here that you're given some extra dialogue with Ronnie as you progress towards the Baleful Shadow Assassin, and she reveals to you the famous quotes that many people reference about she, Millennia, and Mikola being Empyreans, and that she thinks Blythe and E.G. and now even you are willing to give too much to her. Progress until you encounter the Shadow, and you will find out that it shockingly resembles Blythe. When you approach, she will talk to it directly, telling it to tell the two fingers that Ronnie the Witch is coming to rend their flesh. After killing the last Shadow Assassin, she thanks you, calls you her dear, and asks you to tell Blythe and E.G. that she loves them. As she leaves, she gives you the discarded palace key, which says it opens a treasure chest passed down to Carrion Princesses that is found near Renala. Once you go to Renala and open up the chest located behind her, inside you find the Dark Moon Ring, which states that its purpose is to be given by Lunar Princess Rani to her consort. Hint, hint! Long story short, you chase after Rani and eventually find her, located beneath the Cathedral of Mana Seles, where she sits without her robes or hat on, in front of her own two fingers, who she personally killed at long last with the Finger Slayer blade that you found for her from Nocron. She's sitting there motionless though, so you place the ring on her finger and she disappears then reappears as her normal self and tells you that she's glad you're her consort, before disappearing again and saying that you will meet again after you travel the path of the Lord, aka after you complete the game. At this point, if you travel back to Ronnie's Rise, you can finally stumble across Blythe, who is now hostile, crouching over a dead body and mumbling to himself. If you listen into what he's saying before engaging in combat, you can actually hear him saying, no, I'm part of her very being. I could never betray her, no matter what might happen. Rani, she needs me. And then, confused and disoriented, you have to put him down, because he couldn't resist what he was destined to become. The body that he's crouching over before your fight is a Black Knife assassin, and as a reminder, the Black Knife assassins are in service to Rani, who was most likely sent to try to stop Blythe once E.G. learned that he broke out of his cell. If you talk to E.G. again, he says that he will catch up with Blythe soon enough, and when he does, he only hopes that the poor Shadow will accept his apology. You can speak to Rani again by resting at the new gray spot that appears at the top of her tower, where she will explain to you exactly what it is she plans to do with the world once she has her way. She says that her order will not be of gold, but will be of the stars and moon of the chill night, and that life and souls and order will be unbound, and that the certainties of sight, emotion, faith, and touch will become impossibilities. She asks once again if you will still become her lord, and at the end of the game, you have the option. Once you've defeated Radigan and the Elden Beast, you can choose to summon Rani before the Elden Ring instead of mending it yourself. Doing so will successfully end her questline and bring on the Age of the Stars, which entails Rani allowing Grace, the Greater Will, the Elden Ring, and the Erd Tree all together to fade away into nothingness. You then become her one and only consort and lord alongside her, and the two of you live happily ever after. The end. For now. If you're interested in a deep dive explaining Rani's ending in detail, then remember my buddy Monster Maze? You might want to check his channel out because that's exactly what he's about to cover. Wow, this video became really, really long, but I felt that everything I covered was necessary for understanding the full picture of Ronnie the Witch, and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching, and if you're still watching, please consider leaving a like on this video since that really helps out with the algorithm. And subscribe to stick around for all the other lore dives we have yet to delve into on the channel. And let me know in the comments below who you would like for me to cover next. If you missed the previous video about Merica and Radigan, I'll have it linked in the description below. As always, huge thanks to my bandit crew, and a warm welcome to the new members of Crispy T Plays and Ashley H, who recently joined up right here on YouTube. That's all I've got for this one, so as always, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. This is Bandit, looking forward to seeing you next time, and signing out. Peace!